imagine it's the early 1900s and you're a teenager and a lot of your friends, when they're turning 18, they're getting their first horse as a, as a massive kind of graduation gift. And you are asking your parents for this. Year after year, you're excited, you're anticipating this, and sure enough, the years become months, the months become weeks, the weeks become days, and before you know it, it's your birthday, you're 18, and your parents say, we have something for you outside. They tell you to close your eyes, and they they lead you outside, and all of a sudden, you open your eyes, and you don't see a strong, beautiful horse You see a metal box. You throw up your hands and say, what is this? Wasn't I clear about what I wanted? And your parents respond, no, you don't understand. This is a Model T Ford, a brand new car uh, or brand new thing called a car that has just come into existence. And if you understand what this thing is, you are not going to complain that you didn't get a horse because your parents got you something you didn't even know existed, something that was so much better. Well, in our passage today, we have people who are stuck, so stuck in the old ways, the old patterns of thinking, the old sets of expectation that they don't even have a category for something new and better. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, Avery just read it for us. You can find it uh, on page 9 of your service guide, although it would be best if you have a Bible and find it there. This is the third of five successive clashes between Jesus and the religious leaders that Mark has recorded for us here in chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. Things are ratcheting up. The, The conflict is ratcheting up between Jesus and those who are opposing him. And I think the main idea of our passage today, Mark 2 verses 18 to 22, I think the main idea is that Jesus has not come to fit into your life. He's come to bring you into his. Jesus has not come just to fit into your life. He's come to bring you into his. Of two points, two lessons that I want to think about with you in light of these verses. In verses 18 to 20, we're going to think about how the king's coming brings gladness. In verses 21 and 22, how the king's coming brings newness. The king's coming brings gladness, and the king's coming brings newness. First of all, the king's coming brings gladness. Look there at verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? This question isn't totally out of the blue. In fact, if you're going to be a good Bible reader, you, you need to be able to read a passage, not just as kind of a standalone thing in a vacuum, but in light of what has come before it and what has come after it. You have to be dialed in to that kind of connective tissue that makes sense of what's immediately in front of you. And this is a good example. The Pharisees, you see, were professional fasters. They had mastered the art of fasting. Luke chapter 18, the Pharisee and tax collector, what is the Pharisee thanking God for. Not merely that he's unlike other men, but that he fasts twice a week. Pharisees fasted on Mondays and Thursdays, and I just have to wonder if it was on one of those weekly fast days that the Pharisees happened to see Jesus feasting at Levi's conversion party. Remember that last week? Jesus feasting with the former tax collector and his shady friends. I mean, I can just... Imagine the Pharisees hearing over the rumbling of their own stomachs the sound of eating and drinking. This this new rabbi having the, the nerve to relax and laugh in the presence of such undignified sinners. 
And so it prompts a question. I don't think we can understand our passage without understanding what has prompted the question. How is it, Jesus, that other religious groups have enough respectability to fast, but you and your crew fancy yourselves, apparently you fancy yourselves, above this sacred practice? Don't you know, Jesus, that the things of God are serious business? To understand what's going on, we have to understand something about fasting in ancient Jewish life. The only time, actually, in the Old Testament that fasting is commanded, not the only time it's mentioned, we heard our scripture reading earlier from Isaiah 58, which is largely about fasting, but the only time it's actually commanded is in Leviticus 16, which is a load-bearing chapter in the Old Testament. It's the chapter about the Day of Atonement, and that was a prescribed annual fast for the people of God. And Jesus and his disciples probably did participate in that nationwide fast on the holiest day of the year. But what's being asked here is, Jesus, why don't you and your disciples do more than that? Why do you only fast yearly? What about monthly? What about weekly? What about twice a week? I mean, Jesus could have just responded and said, well, because God doesn't require it. But he punctures through the question to get to the deeper issue. Verse 19, Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. In this first illustration here, Jesus is not referring to groomsmen as we would call them today, but to all the guests at a wedding. And in this culture, weddings were utterly epic events. They lasted for an entire week. Just imagine the, uh, the kind of best man or maid of honor or whatever they had back then at one of these ancient Jewish weddings standing up at the beginning of the week's festivities and saying uh, some words of welcome, saying some kind things about the bride and groom and saying, yes, this, this amazing aroma that, that you smell wafting from those tables behind you, heaping with, with, uh, with piles of food. But before we begin, just want to make one final announcement. We are actually this week going to refrain from eating anything. So you're welcome to talk among yourselves, but please do bypass those tables of food. Again, welcome to this glorious occasion. That's the illustration Jesus counters with. He's noting the obvious fact that a wedding reception is a feast, not a fast. I mean, sure, when it's over, fasting will again become appropriate. But right now, he's saying, there is a wedding in process. And his disciples, he's saying, my disciples know what time it is. And they're acting accordingly. You see what Jesus is claiming, friends? He is not simply claiming to be the party rabbi. He's not simply claiming to bring joy to the world. He is claiming a specific role that belonged to God alone. He is claiming to be the bridegroom of Israel. This would have not been lost on the original hearers. Isaiah 54 your maker, Israel, your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. Isaiah 62, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Hosea chapter 2, I will take you to be my wife, Israel, forever. And Jesus is saying, Good afternoon, I'm here. One old theologian reflected on this truth with these words. Quote, The creation of the world seems to have been especially for this end, 
this purpose, that the eternal Son of God might obtain a spouse toward whom he might fully exercise the infinite benevolence of his nature and to whom he might, as it were, open and pour forth all that immense fountain of love and grace that was in his heart. In Jesus, the kingdom of God has made a personal appearance on earth. And in Mark 2, he's looking at these people and saying, Jesus is saying, are you really going to fast when the bread of life is in your presence? He's not delegitimizing the, the practice of fasting. He did it in the wilderness. As we saw in chapter 1, he gives instructions on it in the Sermon on the Mount. He actually assumes the process, or he he assumes the practice, especially after his departure. In Acts 13, the church in Antioch is found worshiping and fasting. In Acts 14, elders are being appointed in the churches in connection with prayer and fasting. Now, different religious traditions think about this practice in different ways. So it's very important for me to be clear here that biblical fasting, you have to know this in your bones. Biblical fasting, going without food or drink or something that to refrain from will sting. It'll hurt. That is not a practice that in any way merits heaven's favor. You can't make yourself right with God. You can't keep yourself right with God through fasting or any other religious work. All that's required is faith. And yet, understood rightly, understood rightly, fasting can be a healthy and helpful spiritual discipline in the life of a Christian. It can be beneficial, especially in times of desperation, When you're at the end of yourself and you're crying out to the Lord of heaven and earth for wisdom, for help, for change. It's a way of saying, I want God. I want this good thing. This thing that I trust is good according to your word. I want this good thing even more than I want food. Ultimately, it's saying, God, I want you. I want you even more than I want food. You are my food. You are my sustenance. You are my nourishment. You are all I need to move forward through this hardship. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be food. It can be wise to abstain from anything that you're tempted to to kind of just turn to, to to lean on for self-medication, for coping, for surviving. It could be fasting from television or social media. That, That, from time to time, can just be a good way to look at those things, which are not bad in and of themselves, but to look at those created things and say, you are not my creator. I don't need you in order to cope. I don't need you in order to survive because the bread of life, Jesus Christ, is enough for me. There's more I could say about the practice of fasting. It's an important topic. We preach expositionally here at River City, which means that uh, we just preach the next passage that God has assigned to us. So I'm sure this topic will come up uh, in future months and years. But we're going to move on now because actually fasting is not the main focus of this passage. It is the occasion for the question, but it's not the main focus. To understand that, to understand what is the main focus, we have to look at the other two illustrations because they're all converging together to make the same laser-like point. So first, the king's coming brings gladness, and second, the king's coming brings newness. Look at verse 21. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. 
Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. Now, I've never been accused of being very domestic uh, in my gifts, but uh, I have read up on what is going on here. And it's just the, the simple reality that an old garment, because it's been washed over and over, has shrunk. And so if it gets a tear and you try to fix it by just sticking a new piece of cloth on top, well, the moment you wash the whole thing again, that new piece of cloth is itself going to shrink, and you're going to end up with a far worse tear than what you had at the beginning. You're going to create a worse problem than what you started with. In other words, Jesus is saying, this new kingdom I'm bringing is not something Hear me now, he's saying. This new kingdom I'm bringing is not something you can just patch onto your life. It's something that must transform the whole thing. You need a whole new garment. And he makes the same point in his final illustration, verse 22. Look there. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. In the ancient world, wine was stored in leather skins that were soft and flexible when they were new, but over time started to grow rigid and brittle. So if you poured new wine into an old container, the wine, as it began to ferment and expand, would crack and break and ruin the valuable stuff inside. You would lose it all. And Jesus is saying that the gospel of the kingdom is like brand new wine that has come to burst our assumptions of what religiosity looks like, what religious devotion looks like. The new wine of my kingdom teaching, Jesus is saying, must be encased in the new covenant, in the new community I am forming. On a congregational level, when I think of the the image of of old wineskins, I can't help but think of the reality of church traditions, which despite the best of intentions, can grow like barnacles on the life and worship of the people of God. Now, I realize where where I am. I said earlier the disciples knew what time it was. I I know what time it is. We are 11 weeks old as a church. So we don't yet have a bunch of old wineskins of custom and crusty tradition. But I want to take a moment here even in the early stage, uh, the the early days of our existence as a church to distinguish between two things that you see in our worship service. This will be helpful for you to have these two categories as you think about what we do when we gather on Sunday mornings. And these two categories are what theologians have long called elements and forms. So we're talking about the gathered corporate worship of God's people and the difference between elements and forms forms. And I'll tell you what those terms mean in in a second, but you also need to understand that they're both related to what's called the regulative principle. The regulative principle, which is the idea that God's word ought to regulate. That's where you get the word regulative. God's word ought to regulate the worship of God's people. God's word ought to regulate everything we do here. When we gather together, this means we can't just do whatever seems best to us. Whatever we think will work, whatever we think even will edify, we have to have biblical warrant for everything we do in our gathered worship. So the elements are the things that that Scripture requires us to do. Sing, read Scripture, hear it preached, Celebrate baptism in the Lord's Supper. We don't just do those things because we think they'll work, because we think they'll edify. We do them because Scripture prescribes them. But if those elements are the what, the forms are the how. The how. And, and, and there, the Bible gives a lot of freedom and flexibility. Some of you will be familiar with the name Trip Lee. Trip Lee. 
He's a well-known Christian hip-hop artist, but he's also a pastor. And several years ago, he wrote an article for Nine Marks titled, Must All Regulative Principle Churches Look the Same? And Tripp observes this, quote, while our churches should not be innovative in the content or the components of our services, the way we carry those things out is, to some degree, up to us. Scripture gives us the substance and the elements, but within broad biblical guidelines, the forms are flexible. So, we can sing old, wordy hymns or repetitive contemporary songs. We can pray for an hour or five minutes. We can preach calmly and lecture-like or loudly with a melodic climax at the end. We can take communion every week or every other month. Church members can shout hallelujah during the sermon or just give a quiet mmm. <laughs> but I'll add, notice he didn't leave an option for doing nothing. <laughs> and of course, there are, in, he writes, there are inconsequential circumstances like seating and service guides. You can sit in chairs or pews. You can read song lyrics from a brochure or a big screen. And then Tripp concludes, quote, Sometimes we can be tempted to force our chosen forms on others. No church exists outside of a context, so we shouldn't assume our way is the way. This snobbery assumes that our cultural norms please God more than others. Yes, idolizing contextualization leads to compromise, but being oblivious to people's needs is a compromise of its own. Our God has created diverse peoples, and any attempt to erase that diversity opposes his wise design. Beloved, here's the bottom line. It's good to have convictions about the way we do church together. It's good to care about what we do and why. But let's make sure that we never assume that our applications of biblical principle are so pristine, so right, so impervious to critique that we begin to treat the flexible forms as if they're the inflexible elements and start to think that we have it all right or judge others for not doing things exactly the way we do. So do you see how Jesus' three illustrations fit together? The, the, the wedding feast, the ripped garment, the old wineskins. He, he's like, here's the thread that stitches them all together. He's like, you want to talk fasting? Do you realize you are at a feast? Find another time to talk about fasting. You're staring at the divine bridegroom of the new Israel, the new people of God. And he's saying, come, I'm inviting you to be part of this new family, this new order that I'm bringing about. But be warned, he's saying, it's going to crack your expectations. It's going to burst your assumptions of what religiosity will look like. No, I haven't come to abolish the law, but I have arrived to fulfill it and to fundamentally reorient your way of being in the world. Do not, Jesus is essentially saying, do not think you can keep your old garment of tradition and custom and moralism and just add a little grace patch. I am not, Jesus is saying, I am not in the patchmaking business. And I, my agenda will not be merely sewn on to any merely human program. I'm not just here to tinker with your religiosity. I'm here to transform it. Read your Bibles, he's saying to these people. The prophets of Israel, your own prophets, were promising and anticipating and longing for something more than just a little messianic upgrade. And friends, he says the same thing to us today. If you think you can just come to church and patch on a little Jesus to your life with few implications for the rest of your life, then you, with all due respect, friend, don't yet realize who he is. 
Jesus Christ will not be relegated to the little tears and leaks in our life. I can almost just imagine him saying, fine, quote me on your bumper stickers, on your wall hangings, on your social media bios, but I don't intend to stay there. I plan to move in and rearrange the whole architecture of your life. I'm not your mascot. I'm not your accessory for your spirituality. I'm not an app for your latest do-it-yourself religious project. I am the king, and I demand total allegiance from a brand new heart. Now, I know, again, what time it is, so you and I mean this redemptive historically, I'm not talking about 1136, I, I know that you're probably not tempted to squeeze Jesus into the mold of ancient Jewish custom. But you know that the default mode of the human heart is the same now as it was then. The default mode of the human heart has always been moralism. Thinking that you can justify your existence by doing stuff or by not doing certain stuff. It's not that God doesn't care about the stuff we do. He absolutely does. I mean, the law of Christ is like the railroad tracks on which the Christian life runs by the fuel and the power of the Holy Spirit. But the favor of God, the love of God, the acceptance of God is not that train's destination. It is the fuel. We don't work for God's grace. We work from God's grace in the power of the Spirit. And all the while, the world's system and our sinful flesh and our enemy, the devil, are collaborating to get us along the way to smuggle in works to smuggle in works as the basis of our standing with God. And even if you think of yourself as a good Protestant who would never, ever entertain or flirt with something less than salvation by grace alone through faith alone, the world, the flesh, and the devil will collaborate to try to get you to smuggle in assumptions of how God must work in your life. We saw this a few weeks ago, but it's, that, it's still that same impulse of, well, because I saw God work in this way, at this point, I know for sure he's going to do this again. Jesus is saying, no, your templates for how I'm going to work are like old brittle containers that I'm going to burst. Your assumption, for example, just to take one, because he's saying, I've, I've seen it on those wall hangings and on those bumper stickers. Your assumption that I will never give you more than you can handle is absolutely wrong. I will give you more than you can handle because I love you. But see, I'm not going to, though I'm going to give you more than you can handle, I'm not ever going to give you more than I can handle. I'm going to do it so that you'll depend on me. Sebastian earlier welcomed those of you who are here and are not Christians. And I'm referring both to those of you who came in knowing you're not a Christian, and those of you who perhaps came in thinking you were. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you've never turned away from your sin and trusted in him as, as your Lord and your Savior and your treasure, then what you need to hear this morning is that if you're trying to, to patch Jesus onto your life, or to use a different metaphor, if, if Jesus is like a hood ornament, on a car that you're driving, that car is not going in a good direction. The best thing you could actually realize this morning is that you are not yet a Christian. That, that could be the best possible news that you hear because we need to hear and understand and internalize and personalize the bad news that apart from Christ, we are lost and ruined and barreling toward destruction. We need to understand that before the good news will sink in. Now, I'm a pastor. Of course, I don't think it's good to not be a Christian, but it, it is worse to think you are, to just think you are and not be 
thinking you can just have enough spirituality, just enough church, just enough Jesus to keep God at arm's length, just enough decoration on your car while your hands remain firmly gripped on the wheel. As biblical scholar Don Carson puts it, quote, the New Testament does not offer a lot of encouragement for people who just want enough Christianity to be saved. A resume that reads, Messiah of Israel, Savior of the world, Lord of heaven and earth, indicates that the person featured is probably overqualified to just gov govern two or three areas of your life. He wants it all. And if you renounce your sin and rely on him to forgive you, as we saw a couple weeks ago, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, to save you, then guess what he'll do? He won't wag his finger at you. He won't scold you. He will throw away your torn up attempts at patchwork religion. What the prophet Isaiah calls filthy rags. See, a Christian I don't know what you thought of Christianity when you came in, but I'm here to tell you the good news that a Christian is not someone that God sees as covered in filthy rags with just a little Jesus patch. No, a Christian is someone that God sees decked from head to foot in his own son's attire, in the royal and radiant robes of righteousness purchased for us by the king. Well, in conclusion, I, I don't know if you noticed it, but look back at verse 20. In verse 20, we heard the first whisper in Mark's gospel of how this news, this good news, this, the restoration of all, the salvation of sinners and the restoration of all things, how it's going to come about. The time will come Jesus says, when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. The word Mark uses here for taken away, the word Jesus uses, Mark, Mark's quoting him, but the word is a strong word. You know, it's actually an echo of a 700-year-old promise regarding the suffering servant. Isaiah 53, verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he, the suffering servant, will be taken away. He will be cut off from the land of the living. Jesus is saying, hey, I've not just come here to Galilee and first century Palestine to create a temporary feast of joy. I have come to make it possible forever. But in order for that to happen, I first have to die. And before long, he will be hanging on a Roman cross, stripped in humiliation, so that you, through faith, can be clothed with honor. As he's suffocating to death, on the cross, he will cry out, I thirst, so that your heart and soul could be forever quenched. He will be forsaken by God so that you could be welcomed in, swept into the feast forever. And if you trust in me, he's saying, if you order your life around mine, not just with a little patch but if you give your entire self to me, then there is coming a day when the wedding party will never end. And oh, by the way, you're not just going to be there as invited guests. You're going to be walking down the aisle. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the good news that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Help us, Lord, not to ever try to patch you 
onto our agenda to try to squeeze you into the mold of our own life, but Lord, rather let us walk into the expansive, generous, loving life that you have offered us. And it's in your beautiful name that we pray. Amen.